He is the God, and there is none other like Him. There is none above Him. There is none beside Him, and all are below Him. And He alone is King, and He alone is God. He always has been, He is, and He always will be. He is eternal. And what is so awesome is that through Jesus Christ, His Son, he gives us eternal life. But it is only and can only and will only be found in Jesus, through Jesus, because of Jesus, by Jesus, and for Jesus that you and I have life and have that life more abundantly. Amen? All right. Turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We're going to look in verse 19, John chapter 20, verse 19. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you four verses that we're going to read in succession. And they're going to be verses that we're going to spring from. And we'll go back and start with John chapter 20. And we'll do a verse by verse study this morning through... <coughs> these verses and some other verses on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. We'll do, we'll look at part one today and then there is no doubt we'll carry some over into next Sunday and do part two. And then hopefully after that we'll start on the gifts of the Spirit 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is where we'll primarily go. And through those chapters, we will do verse by verse. Uh, and we're not going to take 20 weeks to do this, but we'll do verse by verse and cover as many verses as we can and as much as we can hopefully comprehend in one church session. So... Let me just say this before we begin. Actually, let's pray. <coughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, above everything, we ask you, Lord Jesus, for the Holy Spirit power this morning to rightly divide your word. Father, to take it in its context, in its truth, and Father, that you would help us and that you would lead us and order our steps into the truth of your word for your glory and for your honor. Father, that we will respond to your word in love, in obedience, and in receiving and experiencing, Father, everything that you have for us to empower us to fulfill the destiny and the purpose and the calling and the mission that you have put within us. And that destiny, calling, purpose, and mission is the life of Jesus living through us and affecting and touching the world in which we live and in which we move about on a daily basis. Father, I pray that you would bind Satan from any deceit, any error, any leading astray. And Father, lead us in the truth of your word we ask again in the name of Jesus and that he be glorified and the church said. Amen. Amen. When you begin to talk about the dwelling of the Holy Spirit at salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the being filled with the Holy Spirit, there are so many different views, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, but I will only uh, just touch on it briefly and then we'll get right into our Bible study. There are so many different views. There's what's called the uh, since the cessationist view. That just simply means that there are many people who believe and love Jesus. They love Jesus. 
But they believe that when the last apostle died, the apostle John, then all of the miracles and the gifts of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit ended and is not applicable to us today. And you get saved, you get born again, um, and we're to be walking, we're to be led by the Holy Spirit, but it stops there. Then there are those on the very far opposite spectrum who we call sensational, sensationalists, and that's those who believe that when you get saved, you do not get the Holy Spirit. And He comes into your life in a subsequent event by the laying on of hands of the church or somebody and that you then receive the Holy Spirit and that receiving of the Holy Spirit is validated by the gift of speaking in tongues immediately at the reception of the Holy Spirit. You're receiving Him into your life. And then the gifts become operable in your life. And in the sensationalism, it's more about literally what that word says. It's more about the gifts than it is the giver of the gifts. And more the focus is on the gifts. And the Holy Spirit is just a means of getting to the gifts. Which is absolutely wrong. You know, it's like a child at Christmas who on Christmas morning, many children and their thought in their mind is their parents are just the avenue to the gifts under the tree. You hear what I'm saying? Well, many of the far uh, sensationalists, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit is just a means to the gifts of the Spirit. Are y'all tracking with me? And that is total error. That is totally wrong. So, when it comes to biblical interpretation, we need to have the balance of Scripture and know what the Word of God is rightly divided in its context. So, what we want to do this morning is we want to look at John chapter 20 and all these other verses in an Old Testament setting, a setting in the Gospels, and then a setting in the New Testament epistles, Acts, and then the epistles, and even the book of Revelation, if, if we see to have time today to see some things there. So let me start off by reading something I've written down. My experience... Are y'all listening? Say amen. amen. My experience does not validate and confirm the true meaning and interpretation of Scripture. Did you hear what I just said? But my lack of an experience does not disavow the true meaning and interpretation of Scripture. Are y'all hearing me? So just because I have experienced something that seems real and right to me does not necessarily mean it is backed up with the Word of God. Nor does the lack of me personally experiencing something the Bible teaches means that the experience does not exist for me or for believers today. So the bottom line is I don't judge the Word of God by what I've experienced nor by what I have not experienced. I judge the Word of God by the Word of God, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, rightly dividing the Word of God. Old Testament Gospels and New Testament Epistles. When I say Epistles, guys, that's just the New Testament writings of the Apostles. Uh, the book of Acts all the way through the book of Revelation. Even though Acts and Revelation aren't considered an epistle for today will consider them as, as that. So I need to have an understanding of what did the Old Testament say would happen and points to? What did Jesus say is and would happen and he pointed to? And then what does the 
epistles, the rest of the New Testament, point to as being current, not just, and, and concurrent, not just did this cease or that cease or what have I experienced or what have I not experienced? Because a lot of people really base their faith on what they've experienced and they become easily set up for deception and atrocious error. But a lot of people base what they believe on what they've not experienced. Well, that ain't happened to me, so that can't be real. That's not true. That's not true at all. Just like it's not true when someone says, well, this happened to me, so because this happened to me, I had this dream, or I had this crazy sensation, or I saw this vision. Let me tell you something. I don't care what you felt, what you saw, or what you experienced. If it can't be validated by the Word of God, it wasn't from God. Amen. Are you hearing me? And I don't mean just picking a scripture out to support something that has happened to you or me. I'm talking about within the context of exactly what the Word of God says, means, and is pointing to. And let me just share something with you guys. If I and you will base all of my life and all of my experiences and all of what I seek, on this Word of God, truly to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be obedient to this Word, I will not go wrong. And you will not go wrong. Now that doesn't mean you won't make doctrinal mistakes. We all can. And we all do. But what it does mean is the Holy Spirit will lead us into the truth. And God will get us into the truth. And where we have found we've been in error, what do we do? We repent. And we turn to Him. God, I missed the boat here. Are you hearing me? I missed the boat. Now, I can't speak for you, but as a Christian, and even as a pastor and a preacher and a, and a Bible studier, there is many things I believed when after I got saved, let's say the first eight or ten years, I found out wasn't quite right. Wasn't quite in line with the Lord of God. But there are many things I did not believe and accept that I found out through further study, not further experience or lack of experience, but through further study, I didn't quite get that right either. So this, this morning and next Sunday is one of these subjects in the Bible that you're going to find many differing opinions on. I'm not trying to put my opinion on you. But I am offering for you this morning to study the Word of God with me as I study the Word of God and present it to you. And then you allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to the biblical conclusion of what God's Word says. Amen? Amen. All right. With that said, let's get started. In John chapter 20, verse 19, let me give you the, set this up real quick. This is resurrection night. This is Easter night. It is in the evening. The disciples are scared to death. They're hiding in this upper room. They're there with, uh, there's ten of them there. Judas obviously has already killed himself. He is gone. Thomas is not with them. He shows up later, a few verses later. He's not with them. There's ten disciples, James, John, Peter, and all the rest. They're in the upper room. Mary has told them that Jesus is risen from the dead. Peter and John have seen the grave is empty. Mary, though, is the only one at this point that's actually seen Jesus. Now later he'll show up on the road to Emmaus and speak with some others, so on and so forth. In the book of Luke. And this is what happens. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for the fear of the Jews, they thought they were going to die as well, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. 
Now, when the Bible says Jesus came and stood in the midst, that doesn't mean he knocked on the door. No, he just come through the wall. There he is. There he is. He has a new resurrected body. So, his body is immaterial, and he can walk through matter material without even stopping it. But yet his body is tangible. That means it can be touched. He's not like a hologram. You can't, he can't eat food and you see it go into his tummy. So he's, he's not like a hologram. He is a whole person. He is tangible. He can eat, touch, and that's a whole for another sermon. But he walks right through the wall or the roof, however he came in, and he says to them, peace. Be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now this is big. This is a part many people read over and don't catch. He is commissioning them now. He doesn't commission them in Acts chapter 2. He commissions them now. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Oh, rock. I can't say it in Hebrew like they do with the at the end of it. But the Greek word is pneuma. He, he breathed on them breath, spirit. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now you can't get around that. That's what Jesus said. I am sending you. The Father sent me. I have accomplished my mission. I died on the cross. I rose from the dead. I've conquered Satan, death, hell, and the grave. All is beneath my feet. I have total, full authority. I am God in the flesh. I rose from the dead. I proved it. And I have paid with my own blood and my life for your salvation. And when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he was saying, all that it has taken for me to save you and give you salvation, I have accomplished. So he's finished his mission. He's risen from the dead. And he said, so now as the Father sent me, I've accomplished all of that. Now I'm sending you. Now the book of Acts, obviously we see that he is sending them. He commissions them to preach the gospel. And Peter preached the gospel after the Holy Spirit uh, baptism fell, and when he, pre which is the significance of the chapter, not the languages, the preaching of the gospel in power as they had never known is the significance of the chapter. And when he preached the gospel, somebody tell me how many got saved? 3,000. So here, Jesus commissions them. And then he breathes on the ten disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. So if you take a literal translation view of this verse, means Jesus actually meant and offered what he said. If Jesus meant something different, he would have said something different. But in literally translating this the view of this, Jesus meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And when he said, receive the Holy Spirit, brothers, those ten disciples received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit at that point indwelled them. They were born again. The Holy Spirit came in them. When they walked with Jesus up to this time, they were kept by who? Jesus. He was personally with them. He said so. They were kept by him. But guys, he's leaving. And for the next 40 days, he's going to be in and out until Acts chapter 1. Are you with me? Say amen. So he's leaving. He's fixing to ascend to the Father. 
and be forever gone until He returns in the rapture and then returns at the end of the tribulation. But He did not leave them as He promised alone, but He would send who? The Comforter who would be not with them as they were when Jesus was walking the earth, but would be in them. And at this point, Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. And He breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, these ten disciples were representative, just like Adam was a representative of all were lost. These ten disciples are representative of all that are saved. Jesus breathes life into us and that life is the literal person of the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. At the very moment you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't get the Holy Spirit at a later day at Pentecost like many preach. You can't. You have to get the Holy Spirit. You do get the Holy Spirit when you get saved or you're not saved. That's not my opinion. That's the Word of God, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You get the Holy Spirit when you get saved. He moves into you. Jesus miraculously, every born again person, He breathes into you. And the Holy Spirit, who Jesus is the giver of the Spirit, we'll see that in a minute, He breathes into you, and the Holy Spirit comes literally to indwell in your body, 1 Corinthians 6, says your body is now the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you. You're not your own. You've been bought, that was by the blood of Jesus, with a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies. <clears throat> Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So this is where we're going to look at the Old Testament. Now remember I said earlier, when you're interpreting the Word of God and studying the Word of God, and you're studying on a subject, you need to see what the Old Testament says, what the Gospels say, then what the Epistles say. So, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Now I'm going to quote Genesis 1.26, you don't have to turn there. The Lord God said, let us, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, make man... Notice he didn't say create. He said make. He made man out of an existing substance that he earlier created. And that was dirt. Okay? He made man out of dirt. And it's the, the, the Greek Septuagint. That just means that's the Old Testament in the Greek language. The Sept, and I said Septuagint. Septuagint. Quite a difference in pronunciation there. Um reads that God is like a potter. So He formed the man, if you will, out of the, the dirt, the clay, and He formed the man exactly like He wanted him. All right, are you with me? God did the forming. God created the dirt, and He created the dirt to make the man out of the dirt. Now watch this. So when God created the man, He made him with purpose, and with, a, and with a destiny. So let me just tell you this. Whose idea was it that God formed that dirt into a man? Whose idea was that? It was God's. And God created man. Now I've said this before, but I just want to leave biblical credit, credence to it. You're not your own idea. You're God's idea. You weren't your parents' idea. You were God's idea before you were your parents' idea. And some of you weren't even your parents' idea. <laughs> but you were God's idea. Amen? He made you for Him. So nobody can ever tell you you were born by accident. No, you weren't. It doesn't matter where you were conceived. You weren't born by accident. You were God's idea. So then in chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says this. <clears throat> Let me get there myself. And I'll try to uh, make our time as efficient 
as I possibly can. Chapter 2, verse 7. And God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he, what's that word? Breathed. He breathed into his nostrils, literally. God breathed into the clay that he made, the man. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Are you with me? So this is where you first see in the book of Genesis at the very beginning. The word pneuma in the Greek. The word rus, rus in the Hebrew. God breathed into man. And man became a living soul. A living being. Spirit, body, soul. God put blood into the man physically. Life is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 11 and 17. But he also breathed spirit into man. A spirit into man. Every person has a physical body, but you have a spirit man that lives in this body. Okay? Blood is the life of your physical body. But spirit is the life of your blood and your body. If your spirit departs your body, your body ceases to live. So you have spirit, body, and soul. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Spirit, body, and soul. Now, here's the thing. When God breathed life into Adam, Adam became a living being. And of course, when he then he took a rib out of Adam and created Eve. Amen. And when he created Eve, he let Adam name Eve and he said, whoa, man. I, I'm trying to help you ladies. I'm, I'm doing my best. Now watch this. He didn't breathe into Eve. Now we know he did. Obviously, she became a living creature. But it doesn't say he breathed into Eve. Now at the disciples, when Jesus breathed into the ten disciples, Mary Magdalene wasn't there. But obviously she got born again. Philip wasn't there. Bartholomew wasn't what Bartholomew was, was. But Philip wasn't there. Stephen wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. But they were representative like Adam was representative. They were representative that everyone who receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit into them ever since that day. Notice also, and we don't have time for a lack of time to go into this. We will some next week. Notice also God created and breathed into Adam singular, one person, the breath of life, physical life, and spiritual life in the sense of man having a spirit. Now watch. But on resurrection night, Easter night, he breathed into a group of ten. Now they each individually received the spirit. Individually. But yet he breathed into them all ten at once. So you have Adam singular but in the New Testament, you have Jesus breathing in the ten at once, which forms what? A body, the church, the beginning. All ten, that's the start. And they're all connected and have in common because now they all become one, Romans chapter 8, with Jesus. And in Jesus, they're all one body in the Spirit. Which is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we have all been baptized into one body. One body that takes place when you get saved. And they're all linked together in commonality as the body of Christ, all ten of them, through the Holy Spirit. 
In the Bible study, remember, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Amen? So here we go. Listen to this. In John 20, 22, Jesus breathed the breath of Holy Spirit into the 11 disciples individually, but all at the same time, indicative of not only each person being born again, but the embryonic stage of the church being born, the body of Christ, born again and made one with Jesus by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Just like Adam was representative of the original creation of life, Genesis 1, 26 and 2 and 7 as we read. When Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the disciples, they were representative of new life, the born again life, that would be birthed in every believer who received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. A new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. The old Adamic nature has now lost its power. And the law is now not how we get righteous and sanctified. Now it's through Jesus and the Holy Spirit being in us. So Jesus in the Old Testament breathed life into Adam, but Adam fell. In the New Testament now, every person born is born again in Christ. Every person born that received Jesus is born again in Christ Jesus. And in John 20, 22, Jesus breathes new life into them when he says receive the Holy Spirit and the new creation happens and they are born again. The Holy Spirit moves into their bodies literally. When Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit, or let me just say this. Some will argue that this was only a temporary deposit of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was only given in a portion until the actual baptizing and filling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But John chapter 3, verse 34 says that Jesus gives the Holy Spirit without measure. I didn't say that. Jesus did. He gives the Holy... Actually, John the Baptist did, talking about Jesus. He gives the Holy Spirit without measure. So... He could not give the Holy Spirit without measure if He only gives the Holy Spirit in a small portion as a deposit until the day of Pentecost. That wouldn't be without measure. So when you get saved, all of the Holy Spirit there is, He is, is going to indwell you. Are you hearing me? When you get saved, at that moment, you're never going to get more of the Holy Spirit. There's not more of the Holy Spirit to get. He doesn't come in portions or percentages. He, why? He can't. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. You can't get more of somebody that's everywhere at once. Now watch. So John the Baptist said of Jesus, He gives the Holy Spirit without measure. When Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the ten disciples in the upper room, they received all the Holy Spirit there is to receive and became born again. They are immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Holy Spirit permanently and eternally indwells them and becomes their holy deposit, their holy seal, guaranteeing them eternal life with Jesus in heaven forever and forever. Now listen to this. Ever since this indwelling took place on Easter night, every person who puts faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Jesus breathes new life, born again life, the person of the Holy Spirit into our body 
and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and the Holy Spirit permanently and eternally indwells them and becomes the holy deposit and seal, guaranteeing us life with Jesus forever. This is why I argue and believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 is a different experience and subsequent experience to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at salvation. But it's not that you're going to get more of the Holy Spirit. They already have the Holy Spirit, all ten disciples, when they get to Pentecost. How are they going to get more of what they already have? No, the baptism at Acts is an empowering. It is a, an immersion of empowering of the Holy Spirit. And we'll discuss this in depth next Sunday. So let me give you a couple of truths uh, to consider and some Bible verses to consider. Jesus' words to receive the Holy Spirit or receive the Holy Spirit and breathe the Holy Spirit helps set up in context two different works of the Holy Spirit. I was listening to uh, John Piper this week, who I listen to a lot. And um, anyway, he's discussing this very thing. Um, and I glean a lot from him. And so, but anyway, there are two things that when Jesus breathed upon them, that set a context for two different works of the Holy Spirit. First, to receive the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of life. Romans chapter 8 and 2, Paul calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of life. Jesus' words are direct and unequivocal. Receive the Holy Spirit. And the disciples receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they are born again. They receive the promise from the Father. The Comforter moves into their heart. Second, on Pentecost, the work of God's Spirit as the Spirit of power. He's the Spirit of life at conversion. And then at Pentecost, He came down as the Spirit of power and immersed them in the Spirit of Power to enable Jesus' disciples for ministry, for witness, for service, to fulfill the mission to the world that God had called them to. That's why in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, I don't think the disciples were not born again at this time. Now, let me share something with you. Turn over to Romans, and then we'll look at these other two verses, and then we'll close. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, if you would, please. Romans chapter 8. We'll wind down. Romans chapter 8. There's just some things, guys, we've got to cover. So Romans chapter 8. Look with me, if you would, in verse 5. <coughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the... Are you there, everybody? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God or at war with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Your lost nature cannot be subject to God. So then... Uh, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now here it is. Are you ready to say amen? amen? But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body's dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. That's because of the Holy Spirit inside you through his spirit who dwells in you. Now listen, this is not rocket science. The disciples received the Holy Spirit at, when Jesus breathed on them. 
I don't think that they were not born again all the way to Pentecost. Because if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to God. That's the Word of God. That's not my opinion. So how can you get born again and say you're a born again Christian, but you don't get the Spirit of God until Pentecost? And then call yourself born again. Are you hearing me? Because if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not born again and belong to Him. So you have to get born again when Christ breathed life into you. Are you with me? So the disciples were already born again. They already had the Spirit of God dwelling in them. So they couldn't get more of the Holy Spirit. No, He baptizes them in a different capacity, in a different office, a new paradigm, if you will. They already had the Holy Spirit of life, but now they get the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the immersion of the Holy Spirit, of power. It's not about the gifts, although there's Holy Spirit gifts. It's about life, and about the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life and to carry out the mission of Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the Bible clearly teaches, in my opinion, that if a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit in dwelling them, that person's not born again. Paul makes that very clear. You can't get around that. In Romans chapter 8. So going into Pentecost, they had to be born again. Now, turn over to Luke chapter 20, verse. Yeah, but I'm gonna... <laughs> chapter 24, verse 49. Luke 24, verse 49. Tell me when you're there. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Actually, back up to verse 46. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary, Jesus speaking, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. That's the commission. That's the, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And he says, and you are witnesses to these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now the Holy Spirit's already in them. Upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued. Most newer translations say clothed. Until you are clothed in what? Power. From where? On high, how did it descend? Like tongues of fire upon them. That was just a sign validating that the Holy Spirit had come just like a dove lit on Jesus. So the Holy Spirit now is lighting on them. But they already had Him in them. Now He's lighting upon them. Now watch. With power from on high. Now turn over to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And we'll finish right here. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Now we'll actually expound on this a bunch more. And look through several different accounts throughout the book of Acts next week. And put everything together. Hopefully Lord willing. Well he is willing. Hopefully I can do it. Chapter 1, verse 8. Actually, look at verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And I love this. Jesus said, you're thinking about things that are secondary and not the most important about in this moment. Here's what is important. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father is putting his own authority but you shall receive what? Power. Spiritual gifts? No. Now do they receive spiritual gifts? Yes. But is that the 
focus of the point? No. What is power? Now listen. Why would he be telling unborn again yet people that they're going to receive power when they don't even have the Holy Spirit in them? No, they were born again in John chapter 20, verse 22. Now they're being baptized, immersed. They're being endowed with, they're being, in Jesus' own words, clothed. They have the Holy Spirit in them. Now, just like in the Old Testament, He came upon Elisha. He came upon Elijah. He came upon Isaiah. Now they know, but He wasn't in them. The difference in the New Testament, the same Holy Spirit, the Spirit of life, lives in us. And now the Holy Spirit also comes up on us and empowers us to carry out His mission. And that's what? Living Jesus out loud and preaching the gospel. You know what is the true validation of that you love Jesus and are full of the Holy Spirit? Not how many tongues you speak in, not how much you prophesy, not how many miracles you that God does through you, the true validation of you and I being filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in the Holy Spirit is you and I living Jesus out loud in our daily walk. Even though all these gifts are wonderful and fine and true, here is the thing. That's not what validates your spirituality and your love for Jesus. What does validate it is when your love for Jesus shows through your eyes, through your mouth, through your attitude and your walk is put into words and you share Jesus everywhere you go. That's the true, authentic validation of the Holy Ghost working in and through you in your life daily. As you teach, as you preach, as you sing, as you walk. And then also, and we'll see this next week, also He empowers us and helps us and that's why Paul says in Ephesians 5, 18, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and not be drunk with wine. He also helps us to live an overcoming life, not a carnal life. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right. I'm done. <laughs> we don't have time for any more drunk. Take up where we left off next Sunday. I just wanted to give you a whole lot of food for thought and explain this. I hope that I was able to present it in such a way that it will make you want to really go study your Bible. Listen, I want to share something with you. Read the Word of God and study the Word of God for yourself. Do you hear me? Asking the Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to direct you. Now, I like using a lot of, and, and I've been doing this for a while too, I like using um, commentaries and solid biblical preachers that I know to help me as well. But when it really boils down at the end of the day, the most important thing is you and I learning how to rightly divide the Word of God by the Holy Spirit who lives in you. That's why John said in 1 John, you need not that any man teach you. And there's coming a day, guys, really soon, I think, there won't be no YouTube preachers or commentaries or Christian concerts or any of those things to go to. It's going to be you, Jesus, and the Word of God. And you're going to have to hide Bible pages in your shoes. And the Word of God, which should be the most precious thing to us now, will be the most precious thing to us then. Mm -hmm. I just, I'll close by a personal testimony. Not long after, just a couple of years after I gave my life to the Lord, uh, man, I experienced a just a true baptism and filling in the Holy Spirit. I didn't speak in tongues. And let me just throw this out here. You don't have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you hear what I'm saying? Now, but hear me. But it is mandatory that we see God and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. 
Man, it was just the power of God moving over me and in me and in my life. That just, I felt like I could just share Jesus with anybody, anywhere, anytime, with no fear, no matter what happened to me, no matter what they said. And it was just something not of myself. It was Jesus. And here's the probably the most awesome thing about that. Guys, I would sit up at night and read and read and read. When I had to go to work the next day, I had to read and read and read. And I literally felt like, and I told my wife this, I literally felt like a sponge that was dry and had been immersed in water. And I was so soaking up the Word of God, and so soaking up the Word of God. And I had a hunger by the power of the Holy Spirit in me, just like you can, just like you and I hope you already do, for Jesus and to know Him and to know His Word and to know, not, not just know about Him, you know what I'm saying? Not just a head knowledge, not just say, oh yeah, I know Jesus, I'm saying, no, no, I mean to know Jesus, to walk, talk. That's why I love that old gospel hymn, In the Garden, I Walk in the Garden. I can't remember the whole song. But the whole song about in the garden is I walk with him and talk with him all along the way. And he with me. It's no longer just a one-sided conversation. God, I need this, 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 and this to take my family. Blah, 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 blah. Amen. No. It's Jesus, my soul. My whole innermost being is starving for you to know you, to learn of you, and for my life to be centered in you. That's living the Spirit-filled life. That's living the power of the Holy Spirit in you, to be centered in you, and to just be however radical you may be for Jesus. Amen? Let's stand
Larry dismisses, brother.